What went wrong? What, what, what went, went wrong? wrong? Well, I, I, I blame our generation, you know. I think the, the boomers, the baby boomers, are the ones that sold out. When was the first time you drank gin? You know, I don't remember when I first drank gin, but I do remember when I first drank vodka. And I was, I must have been about 14 years old, 14 or 15. Okay, that's early. And, and yes, it, it was in Chao. And uh, do you remember my father had a mushroom farm? Yes. And he had this German guy who was uh, from the UN teaching him how to grow mushrooms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, his name was uh, Dr. Something with an M. I uh, can't remember his name, but anyway. So we went over to his house with this German doctor and his wife. And, uh, you know, I was acting very sophisticated. And we all went in and he said, uh, what would you like to drink? And my dad said, I'll have a whiskey. And my mother said, I'll have a sherry. And I didn't know what to say. And I said, what have you got? And he said, um, I've got vodka. And I said, oh, I'll have that. Uh, and they brought, and he, I said, he said, what do you want with it? In it, yeah. And I said, oh, just play it. Oh, no. <laughs> so they brought me a, a thing, you know, he, he gave me a shot of it, and, and I took a sip, and I, I thought, oh my God, I'm going to die. How can I get through the rest of this? Oof. You know? And then. Um, Vodka's a tough one. Uh, vodka's a hard one to be starting with, yeah, yeah. Um, so, but it's funny that you asked me that because I really remember that it was a kind of traumatic beginning to a glorious career as a drinker, uh, which I've gone on to, uh, uh, you know, sample all the different spirits. Yeah. So, it, what about you? For, so for me, vodka holds really bad memories because. Vodka was the first alcohol I got completely drunk on and had a really bad hangover with. And this, I was around 18 oh, okay. and I was That's in Simla. Yeah, I was in Simla for uh, Christmas and New Year's and I was really angry and upset about my that the boyfriend I was with at that time. And it was New Year's Eve and I was just like, okay, to hell with it, vodka. <laughs> and, and I remember it was not a good night, yeah. I mean, it was, no, it, it was a good night, but the next morning was really bad. It was straight from the bottle, so yeah, off. Yeah. It was disgusting, yeah. Well, I remember in college, you know, uh, you, couldn't buy, you couldn't buy booze in India easily. Really? Remember? Oh, yeah. Oh, it was dry. When? Uh, when, when, we, when I was in college in the, in the 60s and 70s, I uh, there, was, there were one or two shops where you uh, got it and they had just a few brands and they were really bad. There was this uh, brandy uh, called Bumblebee. Bumblebee is still around? And so that's what we used to drink. And it was right. foul. Ew, Bumblebee is And we would just buy these bottles and, uh, you know, when we were in college and then just get smashed. And, uh, and they were really bad. For us, you know? Is that why Mama also drink used to drink brandy because it's something Probably. that you guys well, drank I, in yeah, college? Of course, I didn't drink with her because she was much younger. Yeah. But uh, um, I think a lot of Indian college kids, you know, uh, had their booze introduction with bumblebee. <laughs> How awful! Yeah. I know. Yeah. And uh, now, of course, it's it's completely changed, and there are bars, and you can. There was no such thing. You couldn't go to a bar and order a drink. Really? Yeah. But I thought 60s and Listen, 70s. I was the was first woman, first young woman, to smoke a cigarette in the Delhi University coffee house. Really? Me and Rini. Because that was the whole scene, you know, was that in the coffee house, the university, all the boys were smoking. Mm -hmm. And it was intellectual, smoking, talking. Yeah. And uh, was none, of the, none of the women did. And uh, so Greeny and I decided that we would. And so we went in there and we lit up and there was, the whole place went quiet. <laughs> All the, everyone turned around and looked at us. What uh, was this, 1970? 19, no, no, 1968. 1968. Yeah. You started the story revolution there. right there then? I started college in 67. Okay, cool. 
Yeah. And then, you know, 68, I went on that amazing trip. So... Uh, I want to know more about that trip. It's like legendary stuff, right? Yeah, haven't I told you about it? Not much. Yeah. Vaguely, or maybe you told me really long ago and I've forgotten some of it. Yeah. Well, I went... Uh, vegetation. Hi. Yeah. The vegetation it's is mine. there. Yeah. Thank you. Pollination. Mm. The pollination is here. And thank I wanted you. a seltzer, please. Yeah, I got you. Okay. Ah, thank you. Mm. Seltzer. Thank you. Um, so, about this trip. Okay, so the trip, it was called Comex, the Commonwealth Expedition. Okay. And it was this crazy old British colonel guy. But anyway, he managed to get together this group of 500 English students. Okay. in 25 buses okay. and travel from India, from England to Delhi by bus, by, bus, by road, but they drove the buses. They had these 25 buses, 25 people on each, each bus, Commonwealth Expedition. Each bus was from a different um, university. So there was the Oxford bus, the Leicester bus, the Sussex bus, um, and they came and they came overland to India and then they came to New Delhi, where we went college, and then they invited, they, they said they would take some Indian students back with them, mm -hmm. and then they would host us for a month in England, and then we'd have to fly back on our own steam. So remember, this was 68, you know, wow. most of us had never been abroad. Most right. Indians had never been abroad. Right. Um, I had, but you know, no one else on that trip had ever actually even been in a plane. Yeah. So um, we, you know, we had to interview and all that, and they chose, um, they chose five girls and eleven boys, as we used to call them then, men and women. But uh, and then we, uh, you know, they said we, we were going to go overland back with them. So we got ready to do it, but then we found out that because Pakistan is in the way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Indians on the trip could not go through Pakistan. Yeah, we were yeah, at war with them. We were at war, yes. So we had to fly. Okay. Um, but, but we couldn't get, I don't know what, some visa or something. Uh, and we had to have an emergency meeting with Mrs. Gandhi, with Indra Gandhi. You met Indra Gandhi? Yes, How yes, do I not well, know this about you? I, well, I. Uh, I, I mean, know about Jawaharlal Nehru pulling your cheeks. I don't know about you meeting Indira Gandhi no, for Jawala, an emergency meeting. Jawaharlal okay. pulling my cheeks, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that's that was another death, family yeah. legend. Um, but anyway, so we got went in, uh, the, as a little delegation. We went to her and she gave us permission. Mm -hmm. to. And they said, okay, we're going to fly you to Kabul. Okay. So you fly from Delhi over Pakistan yeah. to Kabul. So then we, we arrived in Kabul and they had already left. Uh, so the British Embassy sent two jeeps that met our flight. We came off the plane and got into these jeeps and they said we're going to uh, speed across the desert to Kandahar where you know you'll catch up yeah. with them. Yeah. Yeah. So we said well we want to see Kabul. Yeah, you know, we, we, leave, so yeah, we said please you know, give us a tour of Kabul. So I got to see Kabul in 1968. Wow. It was a sweet, sleepy little town, beautiful mountains in the background. Just, it was, you know, tiny little place, you know, yeah. So we saw that and then we got into these buses and off we went and, uh, you know, whenever, whenever you'd stop, uh, th there'd be these little places where you could have tea mm -hmm. and hashish. It was on the menu. So, you know, the smoke. You could smoke, smoke yeah, uh, yeah, a split hookahs, fan. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So we, you know, of course, took full advantage of that. Um, but then one of the places we went to was, uh, you know, this tiny little village, like three huts and two palm trees. And it was Ghazni. That's, that was the name. Okay. Haven't you heard of Mahmood of Ghazni? Yeah. So if you had grown up in my generation, every Indian kid in history, you heard about this guy, Mahmood of Ghazni, who was some king from there, who invaded India and pillaged India, that was the word they used to teach us, invaded and pillaged India 17 times. The this same guy, guy 17 same guy, times. Yeah. He was like, come in and like help himself. And, 
and now it's just this tiny little nothing of a village. And all, this, 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 this group of Indian kids completely Did you take revenge? Did you take revenge? No, we were just <laughs> laughing our asses off, you know. This is Ghazni, this is where my oh, mood no. of Ghazni came from. Anyway, so you know, that, that's when it went on, but... Um, Did you catch up with the rest of them finally? Oh yeah, yeah, we caught up with them. You know, there were lots of adventures along the way and all that, yeah. But, uh, I, you know, I don't want to regale you with uh, stories. I want to, it's been so long since you've been uh, in New York, so how are you finding, uh, how are you finding it different from the last time you were here? It's different. Yeah? I mean, it's, it's just become a little hostile and a little unpleasant compared to the way it was earlier. Uh, there's a lot more garbage on the streets. There's a lot more crazy people on the streets yeah. and it's a little scary and I would never imagine myself feeling scared on the streets of New York, at least uh, down in Manhattan and downtown where we are. Uh, it's a little disturbing. Actually, the last time I was in Delhi, which was a long time ago now, pre-COVID, I also, uh, I, I mean, I, I've noticed a, a change to a, a similar kind of thing. I mean, I think it's happening everywhere. I mean, haven't you seen changes in Mumbai? Massive changes. And Since the, the time I've been there till yeah. today, there are changes. Yeah. But slowly, unfortunately, over the years, Mumbai is also. Uh, uh, I mean, I feel more uncomfortable now really? walking down the street in a short skirt than I would when I was uh, when I was 18 uh, when I just. Moved and there. that's because of uh, sort of swing to the right politically. Anything that celebrates Hinduism over celebrates Hinduism or things that have just been made up uh, to yeah. I mean just to, to drive it home it's, it's yeah I heard that uh, now when you greet uh, when you greet each other you have to say Jai Hind or something you like that to, you don't have to but there's this whole thing of Jai Shri Ram and Bharat, oh, Bharat oh, Mata yeah. Ki Jai oh, it's wow. become this thing where uh, you know these big the, the big bullies from the RSS and the other uh, organizations, the other right-wing organizations, like they catch people who they think are Muslims yeah. and uh, coerce them into saying Bharat Mata Ki Jai and if they don't say it, say it then they're beaten up. They, get, they beat them up? Of course, beaten up, beaten to death. I mean, I, I don't know if we should talk about this, but there's yeah. this like, massive rise in lynchings related to uh, religious fundamental beliefs. A lot of cow vigilantism, if you've heard of that. There's this huge sudden uh, awareness on the cow being the national, an not the national animal, the national animal is, I guess, I guess the tiger. But a cow is considered uh, sacred, right? That's which is why we don't eat beef in India. Yeah. Uh, Hindus don't eat beef. Uh, Muslims and Christians eat beef, yeah. but. Uh, over the past few years, there's been a ban on beef, so you can only eat buff. You can't eat cow meat. I heard about that. Yeah, yeah. Which is absurd. Like all my, uh, so many of my Hindu friends, friends also eat beef, and yeah. we just can't imagine not, not being able to eat something that you usually eat. You know, and the traditional di uh, dishes in like uh, Maharashtra and Kerala and Gujarat, which were beef dishes, which we, which we just can't cook anymore. Yeah. Oh God. Yeah, so there's cow vigilantism where a lot of lynchings are related to uh, supposed cow killings. It's yeah. it's a very very you know one of, the, one of the weird things along um, one of the developments I guess uh, under Modi was that establishing a minister of yoga, uh, which He's is a completely, freak, completely right wing thing yeah, I mean, yeah. to do because it's another um, you know moving away from secularism and putting a religious kind of thing into the government. Uh, but what was very funny was that everyone here, you know, thought, oh, how wonderful, there's a minister of yoga. It's about self-care. <laughs> people don't, I didn't know the, you know, what yeah. the real motivation was. Uh, everyone swinging to the right, except uh, there was a victory in Brazil last, yeah, last yeah. week. Yeah. That, that was a good, that was a that good was a good, I know, I know, yeah. Um, I think we should but, stop you know, talking about politics. I tell you, the way things have gone, you know, I was, like we were saying, I went to college in the 60s, yeah. and we had such a utopian narrative about hi the history to come. It was going to be the age of Aquarius, 
you know, the Beatles came to India, we were all, uh, but even though that quickly turned, you know, we realized that that was a little bit of a cartoonish thing, the whole hippie movement, but there was just a kind of fundamental conviction that things were going to move towards more and more freedom and equality and secularism, or at least respect, you know, that the progressive wave would continue and that we would eventually be, you know, in a, in a place where people all kind of respect each other. If anyone had told me then, you know, now 50 years later, that this is where we wound up, it's, it is it, like, right? well, it's, it's sort of like a, a, a kind of fever dream or a mad nightmare. You know, it's like, can this really have happened? and how many things have, must have gone wrong between... I often think what, I mean I really wonder about it and it causes me a lot of distress. What, what's, what went wrong? What, what, what went, went wrong? wrong? Well I, 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 I blame our generation, you know. I think the, the boomers, the baby boomers are the ones that sold out. My, our, yeah, I mean they, they had all this um, idealism uh, and you know progressive ideas and faith in equality and, and so on but then they got very distracted by you know I don't know yoga and self-care and buying country houses and uh, you know basically living it up becoming very self-indulgent uh, you know in, in the 80s 70s 80s 90s that generation was living high on the hog. We were all making good money. We were, we had power, like those of us who were in academia. You know, we were kind of controlling the discourse. And there was just this false sense of, um, you know, of everything's okay. But meanwhile, we weren't actually working on the things that had, we had identified as the most important, you know, to keep on struggling with you know, namely uh, social and racial and gender equality. Equality. Not to mention, I mean, in America, I don't know if they ever were very conscious of American imperialism and, and the havoc it wreaks all over the world. They certainly, the boomers were not thinking about that at all. But, uh, you know, that's all I can, I saw this play by um, Michael Bar Bartlett, Mike Bartlett, he's a British playwright. Um, and, you know, he's kind of one of these guys, an unflinching view of how things have unfolded. Um, and it's a play called Love, Love, Love. And it's three acts, and each act, so the first act is the 60s, and so it's that kind of scene, and it's free love, and, you know, um, everyone's, you know, hopeful and excited, everything's going to be wonderful. Then the second act, was um, I guess the 80s uh, and the same characters and then the final act was in the 200s okay. and it was these uh, the, um, the last act was sort of dominated by the children of those boomers okay. um, and these children were so fucked up and so angry and so uh, debilitated I mean just so useless because they, they, they were saying to their parents, you just lied to us about the world and you lied to us about ourselves. You said, you know, that we were, uh, that everything we do will be good and, you know, we're wonderful and, uh, you know, you didn't sort of guide us in any way. You just had this open, uh, but it, it's, it's like such a cringing uh, thing to watch for people of my generation which is people in the theater, all of us sitting there going, ouch, this it is It hit so... you, it hit you where it Yeah, hurts. yeah. And you know, and that, at that point I just felt like one couldn't deny that anymore. You know, you always sort of knew it. And now they have this thing here where people say, okay, boomer. Have you heard this? Yeah, I've heard, I've heard yeah. it here. Yeah. It, I think it means something like, uh, you guys have had your day and had your say and just shut up. Uh, but it's partly, basically what it is, is the recognition of this failure that I'm talking about. That, you know, that this was a generation that promised to change 
the world in very, um, you know, kind of beautiful ways as far as justice, equality, all those things, and then completely fell asleep on the job, you know, and started get, getting massages and going on eco holidays and buying yachts and, <laughs> you know. So then, I well, know the word, well, this I is depressing. Let's talk about something else. No, Let's no, talk but about one your last movies. thing. One last thing is that what I what I've learned recently is that uh, this particular way of thinking is very anti uh, ancient Indian, ancient Eastern, and ancient Indian uh, tradition and knowledge. Which way of thinking? Sort of the ways of modernity. The, the ways of modernity of uh, uh, the selfish ways of thinking and uh, paying attention to. Uh, material over morals it's very anti our ancient wisdom so it's really strange because right now there's this whole wave of us being more Indian than we've ever been which is completely not true because we're not uh, the, the the ancient knowledge which is being uh, you know rehashed right now is completely something else yeah. and uh, uh, I mean it's 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 consumerism yeah, but you know what you're saying about these ancient knowledges, it's not just a Eastern and Asian. I mean, I think we associate a lot of that kind of um, spiritual, you know, more uh, anti-materialist thinking with the East, Buddhism, yeah. old Hinduism. But in fact, I think it's all just pre-modern. I mean, I think four, 400 years ago, most people in the world, including in Europe, uh, had much, much more of a sense of interconnection and, de and dependence on each other and uh, understanding that, that you're dependent on, you know, uh, other species and on the planet and on the ge geophysical forces and the climate. You know, we were all uh, sort of realistically living like earthlings, like we're living on this earth. And then in these three or four hundred years, there's just been this move where we suddenly think we're living on Mars. We can just do whatever we want, change all the realities, make it, you know, just to our convenience. Uh, and then suddenly, well, I mean, I'm just actually kind of quoting, uh, or not quoting, but uh, uh, reproducing the argument of Amitabh Ghosh's book, The Great Derangement. Right, you know that right, book? right, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I've, been, I've been so, uh, I love that book because he's just so clear and is such a beautiful writer. But you know, the important thing he says is that it's only three or four hundred years that this madness is, has gone on. So it's not like, you know, uh, because I think one of the most dangerous things right now, you know, is, is what Mark Fisher used to call capitalist realism, which is this belief that uh, there's no way out of this system, that it's easier to, un uh, to, be uh, to uh, believe in the end of the world than to believe in the end of capitalism. That capitalism is just a uh, force that absolutely has to exist. You know, that, that's the sort of uh, madness of capitalist realism. In fact, it's not, um, it's not that uh, powerful because it's not that entrenched. That's not, a hum uh, that's not an inherently human way of thinking. You know, in fact, you can't really survive very long if you do that. Anyway, uh, that's my little my yeah, rant. I mean, it's one of the basic uh, Buddhist theories, the theory of interdependency, which is actually something that's so su super easy to understand. But I've seen in classes when I'm sitting with like students, Tibetan students and German students and English students and French students. It's so difficult for them to actually grasp. It takes a couple of but it's like everything depends. You you can't exist in 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 uh, solid solidarity and everything. Be it like the tree outside your window, or you know the ant that's feeding on the remains of your yeah. or of all your these Mikhai. all these critters that are on our bodies and yeah, our, all over us all the time. Yeah, yeah. we're all we're all yeah. so dependent yeah. on one another. I've always you know nowadays yeah. in America we have this thing where people say their pronouns. Yeah. I don't know if you have that in India already. Not as yet. I mean, it's getting there. It's getting there. Yeah. It really confuses some people. Yeah, but it's see here, it's completely tied to gender. Yeah. It's uh, whereas I would like it to be tied to biology. I mean, I I would like to be. Uh, I know I'm a they because I'm a bi you know biotic community. Community. I mean, you know, I've got all these That's creatures, I haven't heard that creatures inside me and on me, and which I couldn't exist without all those, you know. All that 
uh, that biome that keeps you alive, all the bacteria and all that. We don't need this gender distinction. You know, I mean, why do we need it? It's, uh, I mean, it's such a banal thing I'm saying, but you know, it's like when we came up with Ms. You know, in early feminist days. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was so obvious. We don't need to know if you're married or not. Who cares? Whose business is that? That it be Mrs. or Miss. So then, Miss. I mean that. But now it's like, why do we need to know if you're a Mister or a Miss? But so listen, that brings us to feminism in India and your movie. And I, you know, I don't think I've just sat down with you and really heard the aftermath of having made that movie and the success. Because the last time I saw you was when I was at the film festival. When you were at the premiere. For the, yeah. You were there for the premiere. Yeah, actually. yeah. Ladies, 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 the worst dushman is the problem. This is the problem. That women are women's worst fucking enemies. We will not stand by each other. We are sitting and pointing fingers. Why did he do this? That's not the fucking solution. Grow fuck it up! And when we sat out to make it, it was supposed to be just like a fun girly movie. But our process, I was one of the writers, yeah. so our process into writing it was interviewing thousands of women. Uh, and uh, we wanted to keep it light, honestly, because we wanted it to be like a happy commercial film. <laughs> but uh, within within 10 minutes of every woman we sat down to talk talk to they would issues would come up and they were all just so angry they were just so angry at so many different wow. things there that's how all, I all ages all gender. all ages all ages all classes um, and what were they angry about <laughs> so many different things everything right from uh, I mean, something very obvious like the way they have to fight for the same position as men yeah. uh, professionally to the fact that they, no matter what happens, they have to multitask as being a career woman and a mother, say for example, because husbands just never step up to it yeah. or rarely do. I'm not saying never, but rarely yeah. do to the fact that you so can't walk down the street wearing what you want to wear. Uh, you can't uh, have a relationship of your choice uh, to, I mean, so many different yeah. things. I, I don't even know where to start because there's no, I mean, so I, many I'm different things. No, I mean, I'm too familiar with all of it, but, but so, uh, do you think the movie, just by giving voice to that fact, the fact that Indian women are angry, I mean, you know, I, the, I love the movie, but the thing I love most about the movie was the title. Yeah, you know, it, it is a great it's title. So in your it? face, yeah. so uh, and, and also funny because that's a stereotype: the Indian goddess the, the with all Kali. the arms. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I thought that that. Uh, so do you think? What do you think was the impact of that film? How was it received, and and uh, how were you treated by like friends and family and all that you were associated with that movie? It was received. Uh, it was received better worldwide than it was in India. So after premiering at Toronto and uh, winning a runner-up, uh, whatever the runner-up prize to the Ch Audience Choice Award, the, the interestingly the film that did win the Audience Choice Award that year was Room, for which Brie Larson oh. got Best Actress at the Oscars. Wow. Uh, so whatever, we were just by a few votes second to that. Yeah, and that's a um, wonderful film. Yeah. yeah, it is. It is a great film. So we, um, it did well internationally. In India, we had a, a two, a two, three week theatrical run in some major cities. After which, it was one of the first films to go to Netflix. One first few, first Indian films to go to Netflix. Really? Where it was for a few years. In its own form, or did they, did they change it a little bit? They didn't change it. Uh, Netflix didn't change it. We had an international cut and an Indian cut. And, uh, and was the Indian cut very much more conservative? No, the Indian cut was a little more... Uh, it had a few things that were a little more Bollywood maybe, like okay. a couple of songs and this one oh. romantic angle. But so, so, so now how did you become a... Subu, huh. How did you become a filmmaker? 
How did you move in that direction? Yeah, when did that happen with you? Because it happened in um, it happened because of Bombay, I think, because I went oh. because I was convinced that I should be a journalist because oh. really stupid because I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I was good at very few things. I was good at writing. So uh, because I wrote, they made me the editor of my school magazine in Mayo. And, uh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, you were a wonderful writer. Really, You're a wonderful writer. So then I was like, oh, I'm a writer. I should be a journalist. And then uh, I decided to study mass media. And then uh, uh, my first, uh, I, I, I did an internship at a magazine uh, at India Today. Hmm. And then I did an internship. In Mumbai or in Delhi? The, uh, in Delhi. And then I did an internship at NDTV. And thankfully, I did these two internships because I realized that journalism is not the fourth state and it's not the watchdog of democracy anymore. So I was like, oh my God. And I mean, in, in college, we were studying like Chomsky and the propaganda theory. And then I was going around like outside like uh, hockey celebrities, outside like the Delhi High Court who were caught in scandals and all that. So it was completely different. I realized this is not what I want to do. There was very little writing involved. Any writing you had to do had to be extremely clamped down. Uh, and then because I was in Bombay, because I was at a cultural, a beautiful college like Xavier's, there was a film society where I registered a film club and I watched beautiful films and I thought this is what I want to do. Again, very different from what we actually end up doing, but I made the choice and I was fortunate enough to have those options of working with filmmakers like Pan, Pan Nalin, yeah. who actually make meaningful artistic yeah. and uh, international I mean, you were so cinema. lucky to connect with him. I was so lucky him. to connect And you did so him. much work with him, right? Yeah, I mean, we still we still work together yeah. and we're still That's working really on fantastic. a number of stuff. In, in the, That's interesting. Can you talk a little about in the the movie you're making now, what might be some of the things you're going for? Oh, uh, it's it it tackles climate change in a very small way, mm -hmm. very very small. But I had to put it in because the area that I that I'm filming in is the western upper Himalayas, and according to me, the Himalayas. I mean, not according to me, but the Himalayas is one of, is, it's the youngest mountain range in the world. It's one of the most fragile ecosystems. And we are one of the first, uh, uh, we are one of the places to experience climate change on a very personal uh, uh, level. It, but basically, mine is a very personal story. It's about a young woman who's undergone a, a, a uh, the first trauma of her life. She's an upper middle class girl from Delhi and she retreats to the high mountains where she has a family summer home to kind of uh, just to get away from the city and find a way to deal with this trauma and her way of healing and coming back to life by spending time with nature and letting time take its course and uh, a couple of very unlikely friendships that she forges with people in the local community who are from a completely different class and generation as herself and uh, yeah. It's it's that yeah. story. It's a very personal, internal mm -hmm. journey of a yeah. character. It's moody, character-driven, slow. We've shot in black and white in the dead oh, of winter. Oh wow! Really? Yeah, it's a black it's and white black film. And, oh, so wow! Yeah, it's a black and white wow, film. Wow! I'm so impressed. More oh, yeah, 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 Wow! Yeah. That's really brave. That that That's, was a very tough, yeah. very brave decision. And yeah. I was oh. my producer and my DOP tried to talk me out yeah. of it but I was very wow, certain from bravo, the beginning bravo. that it has to be a black yeah. and white film. I just, you know, I told you about that movie I saw, the novelist's film, yeah. it's playing at Lincoln, so yeah. it's black and white. That's black and white as well. And I kept on just being so grateful for that. That, that it's black and white. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, I just want to say the thing you just said about, you know, you said it was deals with climate change in a small way but it's a very personal story. That's not a but, that's an and for me. I think it's incredibly important to keep um, the, connect, the connection, uh, you know, this big thing that's happening to all of us in the world, climate. It's very important uh, for artists, especially people who make theater or film, mm -hmm. to keep that connected to the intimate stories of individuals' li li lives and relationships, because that's what people go, that's why we have theater. That's where we have, have films, movies, yeah. all those. And it's not that, that things like climate or disease or any, 
is unconnected yeah, from yeah, those yeah. things. Those, those are themes, but they have to be woven into stories. But, and and yeah. you just have to kind of realize that they are, these are abiding features of our lives. Well, I'll tell you one movie that I show, uh, that I teach in my classes, which many people don't even think of as a climate movie. It's uh, called Force Majeure. Force Majeure, yeah. it's yeah, by yeah, the guy yeah. who just, who made, uh, he's got a movie out right now. Yeah. Uh, Triangle of Sadness. So Force okay. Majeure is one and of the... And Triangle of Sadness. And before try that he to, made the square, to, yeah. yeah. But you just try to think of Triangle of Sadness without thinking about climate. You know, what mm. goes on in that ship and what they deal with afterwards and all that, that's all uh, not even a metaphor. It's like a microcosm. Yeah, after. Triangle of Sadness was genius. Yeah. I loved it. Well, like, and I Force Majeure is similarly, it's mm -hmm. about, you know, what happens when the, the uh, these geological things like avalanches and mm -hmm. snow slides and all, uh, you know, suddenly, uh, come right into your private life and your wife isn't going to talk to you anymore because you ran in the other direction mm. when the when avalanche, the avalanche yeah. happened. That's what I mean. That's what I mean. So there's this really strange phenomena which I actually wanted to talk to you about which is coming along with this right is the wokeism. Yeah. You know? I think the whole idea of wokeness is a right wing uh, conspiracy. I want to know more about that. Well, I just because think I just find wokeness very baffling right now. The, the it's manufactured by the right. It's manufactured by Fox News. They're the ones who keep on talking about wokeness. They keep on talking about specific things because the press in America has always been very anti-intellectual and very anti-academic. Uh. They love to make fun of academia. It's the easiest target. Everyone's allowed to make fun of academia, especially make fun of humanists, because we're supposed to be all up in our head and un, you know, unconnected, unconnected from reality. Unconnected from reality, that's what yeah. they say, no? Yeah, exactly. And so, so that right wing thin, thin feeds into you know, the fact that for years, the New York Times would always have one article. Whenever we had MLA, which is our, which is our annual conference, uh, Modern Language Association Conference of Humanism, uh, there would always be one article, you know, uh, sort of gently mocking or uh, snarkily uh, sniggering at academics. You know, they would pick out. Uh, the titles of some of our, some of the papers and go, ho, 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 look what they're talking about, you know. Uh, this is just such a now cliche, uh, is that, you know, that it's considered to be a, like a parlor game to make fun of academia. And so now, unfortunately, that has merged with this uh, right wing characterization uh, of certain kinds of um, demand for history, you know, and they call that critical race theory. I mean, like, for example, you know, the fact that there was there was this incredible massacre of, of blacks in, in Tulsa in the early part of the, and that all the, all my American friends growing up in this country had never heard of it, whether black or white. It was never taught. Covered up. Yeah. And then you try to add that in and teach that, that's considered to be woke. Yeah. So it's a more complicated thing than it looks like. It looks like a bunch of young people have uh, become incredibly uh, uh, dogmatic and uh, uptight and they're running around censoring everyone. Cancelling everything. Cancelling everything. Now, there may be some of that. Uh, I mean, when you're young and you're political, you know, you are also impatient and you're also brave. You're willing to say yeah. certain yeah. things. Once you're older, you, you know, you don't, you're not so brave. So there's partly there is that, that some, some kind of statements get made that are pretty extreme. Um, but you know, I'll give you, uh, okay, so like one of the examples of wokeness is what they, as microaggressions. People make a lot of fun about, about this theory of microaggressions. You know, they just even think that that word is ridiculous and funny and nobody should be talking about microaggressions. 
Okay. Well, what that is, is like, if you're, if you're a black person, uh, or, you know, Latinx person, uh, what, you're, what you experience throughout your life is like this slow and relentless wave after wave after wave of little insults little little tiny things that any one of them could be harmless but they keep coming they and they mount up to maybe huh? you're, you're saying that all these little insults mount up well they, they're all symptoms of an, that underlying racism i know i know this personally from my own experience from being from feminism from being a woman my generation you had to sit there and grin and put up with all sorts of remarks. Remarks. And of if you course. did if you didn't put up with it, then you didn't have a sense of humour. Yeah, then you're too uptight and you're too uptight. You have a sense of humor. And all yeah. those things. You know yeah, that, yeah. that, that, I, I've been that great well. joke yeah, yeah. about uh, how many feminists does it take to change a light bulb? That's not funny. <laughs> so you know, a feminist are not supposed to have a sense of humor and all that bullshit. But but basically at some point you realize that yes, these are tiny little things, but they're relentless. And if you don't call, call people on them, then you, the next generation is going to have to put up with them. And you know, it's sort of on you then to stand up and be a pain in the ass and say, no, don't make jokes about, about this, this right now. You know, rape isn't funny. Go, oh, oh, where's your sense of humor? So that's my frame of, for analysis of some of the so-called work. Interesting. There was this huge. Um, I mean, I, I've I've seen wokeism growing over the past few years, and uh, there was this huge wave of wokeism in India when the Queen died. Oh, the Queen! Oh, the Queen! Oh. Is she still there? I think uh, she's still there. <laughs> yeah. She took a long time to die. Yeah, she took a long time to yeah. So, what was, the, what was the workplace? So, people who have absolutely no idea about post colonial third theory were suddenly experts on how oh. the Queen personally had ruined India. <laughs> not her ancestors, <laughs> not the imperial crown, but little Lizzie. Elizabeth. Yeah, Lilibet herself. Yeah, little Lilibet. Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. I think it's okay to talk about the empire. Yeah. They did a lot of, they did a lot of terrible stuff, you know. And yeah, we keep of course, of course. Yeah. But we've but emerged from that, yeah, and I we mean, have, we have, yeah, yeah. And, right. and we got the railways and the post. <laughs> as, the post as 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 the as post a byproduct. from our, our family. Post yeah. was, you know, my uh, my great grandfather. I didn't know that. Yes, no, really. Sersham Shavesi. He was knighted by the British for I know he was knighted, but why was he knighted? I thought for he fought in some war. No, 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 no. He established the postal system of North India. Ah, I thought he fought in one of the Afghan wars. The fact I don't admit when I'm in North India. <laughs> the postal system is so bad. But no, yeah. So, and they gave him a, you know, that's why we have a... That's why we have a... A crest. I'm a butterfly.